So Latino Outdoors, we really work to inspire, connect, and engage with Latino communities and people of all backgrounds um, in the outdoors to really embrace cultures and tradition and family to just make sure that we have a more complete outdoor narrative, ensuring that all history is valued and represented in the outdoor space. And so there are lots of chapters of Latino outdoors all across the United States. And I share this because lots of people are tuning in for more than places than, uh, besides California. And so we do have chapters in Texas and Washington and New York and a big team here in the San Francisco Bay Area. So if you're interested in learning more and connecting with us and uh, joining us on future events, virtual or in person, you can learn more about our individual regional group in the San Francisco, in the San Francisco Bay Area by joining our Facebook group or by following us on Instagram with our handle down below and learn more about Latino Outdoors in general at latinoutdoors.org. And we have three main components to our programming. If you wanna go on to the next slide, Jamie, please. And they fall into these categories, Vamos Outdoors, which is really outdoor adventures. And they can vary from fishing to hiking to kayaking, really whatever the interest of the volunteers in the community is. We have a Yo Cuento, which is really storytelling and a blog where community members can share their own stories and we help amplify those voices. And then we have a program called Crecemos Outdoors, which really focuses, focuses on fostering outdoor leadership. So here you can see a few photos from previous outings. Thank you, Jamie. And then I'll pass it over to Serena and from San Francisco Bay Bird Observatory to tell you a little bit more. Thank you so much, Aurora. We're so happy to be part of this event. So as Aurora said, my name is Serena Lau. I am the Environmental Education and Outreach Specialist for the San Francisco Bay Bird Observatory, or SFBBO for short. And if you're not familiar with us, we are a nonprofit based in Milpitas, but we do work all over the Bay Area. And we are dedicated to conserving birds and their habitats through science and outreach. If you'd like to learn more about us, you can visit our website, sfbbo.org. We are actually celebrating our 40th anniversary this year since our inception. And in that time, we've had our staff and volunteers help conduct avian research out in the field. We've been doing habitat restoration and we've been in the community educating people about birds and nature and why they're important and uh, why we can serve them. So we are very, very excited to partner with Latino Outdoors on this event. And I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our speaker tonight, Jamie Sufuentes. Up until recently, Jamie was an ecologist with SFBBO's Habitats team. She earned a degree in biology at the National University of Columbia, where she studied a group of tarantulas from the Colombian Andes. She then did her master's degree in Brazil, where she studied arboreal tarantulas, or those that live in trees, in the Amazon and parts of the Andes. Jamie is also passionate about education and outreach. She recently started a position at the San Francisco Department of the Environment as part of their school environmental education team, while also starting another master's in science education at San Jose State University. So we're very excited to be working with Jamie again for this event. And I can personally tell you that I think Jamie has kind of changed my life a little bit because I will never forget working with her one day. I pointed out a spider that was at our, our native plant nursery. And she just came over and just like stuck her hand up just to get a, a, a better look at it. And I have always had a little bit of a lifelong fear of spiders, just something that was kind of innate, even though I know as a biologist that they're important and they're cool. But just seeing her do that, that was something that I'd never seen someone do. And I feel like that fear, that innate fear of spiders in me has gone down a lot just from that one observation. So I hope that you all get to learn so much from Jamie tonight. I know that it's gonna be great. So Jamie, I'll pass it over to you now. Thank you so much, Zairina. And thank you so much for sharing that. That is so awesome. <laughs> uh, I, I want to thank you both. I want to thank Aurora and Zairina for the invitation. And I also want to thank everybody that joined us today. Um, I am Jamie Cifuentes and I love spiders. So for me, this is a pleasure for me talking tonight about these amazing animals. And 
I know that some people can share those feelings with me. I know some people love them, but I also know that these animals can create like a range of emotions about, yeah. So I just want to check that. How do we feel tonight? So I'm going to share with you this mentimeter where we are going to describe with three words uh, how do we feel about the spiders around the subject of the spiders. So you can go ahead with your phone, enter the QR code or go into the menti.com and enter the code or to the link that Sarina is going to paste in the chat. And please share with us, how do you feel about this subject? All right, so I'm going to start like seeing some of the big words there. So there is scary in the middle, very big, amazing, cool, creepy, interesting, spooky, important, intelligent, love them. Yeah, I love them too. Cute, but I guess necessary, sometimes a bit scary. Ecosystem engineers misunderstood. I like that word for describing them. Crawlers and somebody loves spiders entirely. Totally awesome. Okay, thank you so much for sharing with me, with us, all of us about our feelings tonight, about how we feel about this, this exciting <laughs> subject. I saw many, many feelings about the enjoyment about them, many, mm, so much love, so much scary. And yes, that is why the spiders are in our culture. They like awaken many feelings and many emotion in us. And that's why it is all in track in our culture. So this is just like an example of many of the places that have been found uh, like uh, Im images or sculptures about the spiders and that has been like through all of history of human beings um, like source of myths of legends or or in the, or in the art or in the poetry so it has been like a source of inspiration so i want to give like some examples of that like for example it has been used like a symbol of creation. Uh, the Navajo culture and some um, Native American culture uh, describe the spiders like this creator, these wisdom keepers that, that are related to the grandmother spider. So the grandmother spider is the one that created the war and is the, the one that keeps the wisdom. Uh, we can see other example, uh, for example, in the, in the Nazca lines in Peru, there is like a, a very clear form of a spider, kind of a spider. It's believed that the Nazca people uh, related the symbol of a spider as a fertility. Um, we can see also that in the ancient India, they believed that the spider was the creator of the universe. And it was this large spider that wove a big web that is our universe, and she controls everything that it moves in the universe. And eventually, that spider is going just to destroy the universe and make other again. So those are just like a simple samples <laughs> of how the spiders are in, in different cultures all over the world. But also it is still in our culture, it is still in our art, it's, it continue being source of inspiration. Like for example, in the sculptures that are very famous of Luis Borges, eh, or these paintings of Salvador Dalí, where he eh, just draw some spiders in the middle of their paintings, or the crying spider of Odilo Redon. And I find this very interesting in poetry. I don't know if you share with me the same feeling about this, like the symbol of a spider is about this patient thing, this patient organism, but also give like a tone of somber to those poems. 
And of course, it is all over the TV and the movies. Uh, so they have been described like these big animals that are going to attack humans and that we need to destroy in order to save the planet. The majority of movies describe spiders like that. So there's no doubt why many people have so much fear to spiders. And I want to share this one that is an animated movie, probably one of my favorite movies is called James and the Giant Peach. And um, it appears a, a spider that is kind of a lonely spider. It is not like the devilish spider, but it's this lonely but maternal organism. So it is just interesting. And uh, of course, <laughs> it, our superhero, spiders are so source of superhero for Spider-Man. And then, yeah, it's our, it comes the question, what are these creators so fascinating? They are all up around our culture. So I made a list of some of the things that I think that made them fascinating and I'm going to share with you. So first of all, they are incredible, an incredible diverse group. What does that mean? So after the insects, that is the biggest group in the world, like with the most species described, the spiders follow second. And at the date, there are almost 50,000 valid spiders. And just for comparison, the birds have 10,000 species described. And to the primates, they are just 400 of those species described. Second, they are all conquerors in all habitats we can find them. So in the vegetation, at the level of the ground, they can be making those kind of burrows, like using the vegetation, or they can, like for example, this sports web spider that can, it can make like a kind of a cocoon with the silk. And it is going just to put some debris and some, some soil for camouflage so it can be found in the soil too. Or this little one that maybe you are familiar with that is the cellar spider or the false, false seed spider um, that they are typically in our homes or they can use the cracks in our buildings for construct their webs. But not necessarily just webs, they can be wandering around, around the ground and vegetation. And they can be found in aquatic environments too. So for example, this spider here that is the diving bell spider, is the Arginoreta aquatica. They construct like kind of a bubble around their abdomen. And in that way, they continue breeding. Why? Why in the abdomen? So the spiders have like this kind of a structure ventrally in the abdomen that permit like, the interchange of gases. And so in that way, if they cover that part of the abdomen, they can continue breathing. Also, for example, this other one that is the pisauride, they are associated with the streams or rivers. They can be found in the air so many spiderlings use this type of dispersion. They can just simply uh, like adopt a position in which they leave the abdomen and they start to release two or one or many threads of silk for catching the air. And I'm just going to show a quick video about that too. There we go. <laughs> so yes, they can be found in the air and also underground. So there are some kind of spiders that they make burrows that can be very integrated, like we see it in the in the image of the right. They are very integrated, like burrows. They can have many cameras or just one camera. And it depends of the family of the spider. 
Other reason is that they are more ancient than dinosaurs. That means that they are very ancient. I just wanted to make it a little bit catchy. <laughs> so it is say that the spiders date, like the they the origin began 400 million of years ago. Uh, but the the most recent or or the most old fossil that we can see, like oh, that is really a spider because it. It has the spinnerets. Spinnerets are like kind of an appendages that through they through there they release the silk. So the the fossil that we can find about that is the Atercopus, and it dates from 380 million of years ago. That means it's 100 year millions before of dinosaurs. And just for putting like into a context with us, the spiders are in the Devonian. That is that period in the 359, like to 416. And the humans, like one of the first hominids, are like date from 3.2 million of years ago. So spiders are clearly more ancient than us and than dinosaurs. Other thing is that they have a superpower, is the superpower of venom. And yes, all the spiders have venom, with the exception of just one family that I'm going to talk uh, further about that. Uh, so the venom is producing a gland seal that it is located in the carapace, or it can be like the head, kind of the head of the spider, or it can be associated to the chelicera. The chelicera are like kind of the mouth, are like the mouth parts of the spider. So that gland, that venom gland is attached to a duct that go all the way to the fang. And in the fang, there is a little hole which can inject the venom. So that is the way that the spiders inject the venom. And as I was saying, there is just one family that lacks venom glands, and that is the Uloboride family. And just like a, a Fact, a curious fact or an interesting fact, there is one family that have modified the venom gland for producing like a kind of glue. So they don't create the webs, but they spit on the victims or in the prey. And, and that way they immobilize like from, from larger, like for example, two centimeters, they can just spit on the prey and they just can immobilize. So talking about venom, the venom is a, just a cocktail of proteins, enzymes, low molecular weight compounds and others. And the main function of this is to paralyze and digest the prey. And generally those are invertebrates. Uh, the type of venoms are neurotoxic when acts over the, the, the neurological system of the prey. And necrotic that damage the cells or tissue around the bite and some spiders can present both. But I just want to highlight that of the 50,000 species of spiders that have been described, only about 20 of them have venom that can really affect humans. So generally when there are accidents about the spiders, it is because the spiders feel threatened or accidentally it got caught with your skin or their clothes or their shoes. So it is not that the spider is going to attack you or is going to try to eat you because they really don't, don't prey on us. They know that we are too big for them. So, so yeah, sometimes are just accidents and, and it is in a low proportion. Nonetheless, we have some spiders that are uh, significant, significantly venomous to humans here in California. So one of them is the Western Black Widow. And it is all in the, in the west of California, uh, in the west of the United States. And we have also the reclusa deserta. So that is the violinist spider or the brown reclusa spider. Um, but they, it is found at the south of California, southwest of California. And other thing that we know about the spiders and that they produce seal. Can I just want to play this video for seeing how they wave? It is just a big word of patience and elaboration. And 
I want to show this one because it is going to be so interesting for you to see where the seal comes from. So I wanted that view. So those appendages that you saw, that the silk is coming out is called spinnerets. And I'm going to be talking about that all the time. And they are like some kind of a structures that in the end of the abdomen, and they are associated to many type of, of gland silks or sick glands, I'm sorry. And also like spiders can make like a lot of type of silks. It goes like from two to seven type of silks that they can produce. And they can make many structures by different families. They will have different structures for, for um, making their nests or their, or their hunting uh, places. And I just want to show this case of the bolas spider. So this spider is very special because this is a web spider, but it doesn't do a web. What it does is that it releases a long string, just a long string with a sticky ball at the end and just move it to prey and send it to the prey and catch the prey. But other of the things that is very interesting is that it, the spider produces like a kind of cocktail of proteins that can act like, a, it's like a kind of a scent of a moth. So the female moths produce like this type of scent for attracting males and the spider produces too for attracting moth males. And we're going to see a video here. You can see the ball here. So it is just incredible, interesting how all those modifications. And this is other one that have an interesting modification. So this is the ogre spider. And what it does is that they don't construct like a web, but construct like a kind of a platform. And they have, they construct a smaller one, like kind of a uh, net that they just send it to the prey. So I'm just going to show this video too. Unique to this family of spider. Um, and what they do is they'll, they'll make a frame web that kind of looks like the letter A out of non-sticky silk. And then within that frame, they'll, they'll make a fuzzy rectangular net that they hold with their front forelegs and they'll actively ensnare prey with this net. They can catch prey with this net, both with... So that is other modification. And of course, silk has been used in many of the materials because it has like so many properties. Uh, so many sources say that it is like five times stronger than steel or harder than steel. And uh, also that is, it has a lot of elasticity, like more than nylon. We can see here that uh, we have some of the products, uh, like these running shoes from Adidas that are made like 100% from silk, or this jacket made in North Face with spider silk. And I just want to point out these five startups because they have been they have been using like the material of spider silk in like from textiles to cosmetics. So it is just very promising, like what the material can can be applied. And this is the case of this study or this review uh, that they say that hybrid spider silk with inorganic nanomaterials can create new materials that can be applied in many fields. And 
some other application is in 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 medical in the medical area so the spider silk for tissue engineering application so a spider silk has the property of being antimicrobial too and because it's from organic compounds compounds it can be used for medical purposes and also nature is so wise or it has so much wisdom that other animals have used the spider seal even before us like for example these these birds that construct their nest like with with the spider seal so they they use it not only for giving that glue to the materials but also for giving that cushion and soft uh, texture of the nests and giving that elasticity when the animals are growing six of the or for least they play an essential role in many ecosystems so in a recent study that was like from 2017 there was estimated that a spider consumed between 400 to 800 million tons of insects that is a lot and just comparing with humans humans consume 4 million tons of fish and meat annually but spiders are very important because of that because they keep in control like the population of other animals or other arthropods like some insects or some plagues but one other thing we have been talking about that they are very abundant in all our ecosystems so they are in all parts of the food web they are not just being predators but also they are being the prey they are they are source of food for many other animals like for example this lizard here and it is estimated that provide meals for some of 3,000 to 5,000 species of birds. Yes, they eat insects and sometimes they eat veggies too. So it has been found that spiders from 10 different families, they can be eating from parts of plants, they will, they will be eating nectar or some sap, some leaves, pollen, so that is very interesting and just like an interesting fact there is just one species that is known for being completely vegan that is a jumping spider that lives in mexico and that just uh, survives on acacia acacia is a type of plant and uh, of our list of course there is beauty in those animals not only the ones that i'm showing here that have so many bright colors and many structures and many like incredible things that you can see in these animals um, and i just wanted to show this video that probably are one of the most famous and beautiful spiders So those are the peacock spiders, probably you know about them. They, they are found in Australia and in Papua New Guinea. Um, they are probably the most famous one because they have those displays of courtship of the males through the females. So that is very interesting. And we are going now to enter to the spider's characteristic, how we are going to identify the spiders and I know it is a very obvious question how you can recognize a spider. I know that everybody can do it, but I'm just going to throw like some uh, tricks like for <laughs> for know them better. So first of all, spiders are not insects. They are arthropods. That means that they have uh, their limbs are articulated and also they have an ex exoskeleton. The body is divided in two segments. That is the cephalothorax, that is like the head and the thorax and the abdomen. Also, they have uh, the spinnerets that we talked before about them uh, associated with the seal glands. We also have the venom glands that are associated with the chelicera that are the mouth part of the spiders. And 
we have also four walking legs. We say that spiders have a legs. Yes, they have a legs that are walkable and that are attached to the thorax, the cephalothorax of the spider. And also we have these appendages here that are called the pedipalps. The pedipalps are very important for the spider because they use it for sensory, as a sensory organ, and also like for handling food. And I'm going to talk about the male spiders. When the male spiders uh, like develop in their last instar, uh, the last segment of those pedipalps um, just modified to a structure that is going to serve for copulatory issues. So I'm just going to show that up here. So how will you recognize those male spiders? So you can see that in those pedipalps that I showed before, they have like kind of and gross, like gross part, like kind of boxing globes. So yes, when you see a spider that have those kind of boxing globes, that is a male. And that comes to our next slide that I want to share with you and invite you to explore. So it is tarantula season. From the end of the summer and all the fall, we are going to see these tarantula um, migrations. And, uh, and probably Mount Diablo is one of the most famous places for going and see those migrations. So those, those spiders are male spiders that just came out from their burrows after four or seven years of getting prepared for their reproduction time. So they develop, like in the last insert, they develop some kind of hooks in the first pair of legs, and they develop that last part of the pedipulp for making the copulation. So when they come to a, to a female spider, they are going to start doing the courtship. That means they are going to call in their burrow. So I'm going to show this video. Oh, sorry. So this is a male spider, like just trying to call the female that is inside the burrow. And finally, the female spider came out and it seems that it's receptive. It seems like that. So he tried just to touch, that is part of the courtship too. And like, as I said before, they develop like kind of hooks in the first pair of legs where he's going to try to attach to the fangs or the female and just bent it a little bit and reach with the pedipalps to the seminal receptacles of the female. That is the genitalia. He's trying, but... <laughs> So in this video, there is a unhappy ending because the female eats the male. That doesn't mean that always happened. Um, yeah, it is low proportion of, of those encounters happening, but it is very famous that spiders eat the males after they copulate. 
And I want just to get into spider classification where we can see like which type of spiders we can find like surrounding us. So these are the ma major groups between spiders. So one of them is the mesotele and probably is the more ancient one, live one, and it is founded in the Asian Sudeast. So I'm not going to center of that one, but I'm going to center in the Aranomorpha and Milagalmorpha groups that are the ones that we can find here in the Americas. So first, first of all, the Migalomorpha. Uh, the Migalomorpha are the commonly known like spiders, but they like uh, tarantulas, I'm sorry, but they can they can be known like trapdoor spiders too, or the baboon spiders, like generally are animals big sizes but we can find some families that are very small too. They have approximately 1,000 species described. And these are some examples of the ones that we can find here in North America. So for example, with the, familia, the family Terraphosidae, those are the real tarantulas. And in the United States, there is just one genus of that family. Uh, with many species, but just one genus. So that is one interesting fact. We have this other one that is very beautiful, that is called Nemeside, the family Nemeside of false, false tarantula, and it's called like the velvety spider. We also have this one that make burrows with a lid. That is very cool, I find it. Um, and I wanted to share with you this tweet of somebody that was working in the garden and found this amazing spider. Like he says that he, he saw like a clot of clay with legs pointing out and turned on to be a trapdoor spider. That, that is just amazing. I, I wish I can be that lucky. I, I love those animals. And we have some small ones. These animals are very, very small, but are from the, from the infraorder Megalomorpha, as I said it before. So they have kind of the body of the tarantula, but they are very, very small animals. And now we are going to talk about Aranomorpha or the common spiders that we can find in our gardens or in our house. Those are the true spiders. And there are like 35,000 species described. We can find the or web spiders that generally are from the family Saranaidae, Tetragnatidae, and Nephilidae. Those are the ones that made that kind of or web. There is these ones that have the or web modified that are called the ray spiders because the web, it comes like a ray comes like rate of lights. So that is one of the modification and they are, they are from the family Teridiosomatidae. They are very tiny spiders and the abdomen is very round. So it's easy to identify, just that they are very small. Also, we have these famous spiders that are the cobweb spiders from the family Teridide. They make this kind of mesh web and the sheet weather spiders or the family Nithide, that they make the, the sheet web or are called like the money or the dwarf spiders. And they are very similar, just they can be differentiated just because they have like some kind of legs in the last, some kind of uh, bristles in the last pair of, of their legs. Also, we have these ones, the falsy, the family, or the daddy long leg spider or cell spiders, that those are the ones that we can find out in our houses, or the family citoride, that are the spitting spiders that I took before, or the family anifaenide, those are the ghost spiders, those are very rapid spiders, we can find that in the grass too. Um, the yellow sack spider or this crab spider that generally you will find there in the flowers, just camouflage in there, or the lynx spider that are associated with vegetation, and other wanderers that we are going to find in the grass and in the ground, like wolf spiders, grass spiders, 
brown spiders, the famous one, jumping spiders, some, some ones that can mimic uh, ants, and some wandering spiders. So those are just like some samples of the things that we can find here in California. And final considerations, I just find this group so diverse, like not only in the number of species, or, but in the, in the forms, in the colors, in the habitats, in the structures, in the modification, in the webs, that there is so many things, there are so many things to learn from them. They are still a library for being open, for learning about the, the, the things about their venom, the properties of the venom that can be benefit for us, or the properties for the silk that can benefit from us. So I think that as the person that shared with us in the in the cloud in the cloud world, those are animals that are misunderstood, that have been like portrayed like these dangerous or that they are going to attack us, but actually they are very interesting and amazing. So that is one of my final considerations. And I just want to share back the Mentimeter for you to enter again. And I will ask to um, Sirena to share again the, the link or enter with your QR code and respond the second question. What are your feelings about the spiders? And if it is there something that you want to mention, this is an open question, please share with us what do you think, how you feel, and thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Jamie. That was so cool. I, you know, being that it's spooky season and Halloween is around the corner, this is such an amazing timing of a presentation to really offer us the knowledge and and things to know about spiders to really shift that perspective that you were mentioning, the typical stereotype of scary spiders and and shifting that to see how amazing they really are. So while you all start, if you all feel like you have feelings you wanna share about spiders now, feel free to throw those in the chat and we'll read some of those out. Um, but in the meantime, Jamie, there have been a couple questions that have come in the chat. Are you feeling up to answering maybe some of those? <laughs> yeah, sounds good, yes, please. <laughs> so one of the first questions that we got uh, was, when you were talking about the ranges of different spiders and where they're located. And so the question was, how can it be known for sure that we have no brown recluse spiders here? Like, couldn't they travel here on a vehicle? So like, how do you know what region spiders are actually in and how can they travel from different places? Yeah, so there is a web page or a source where the people that work with toxins, they just put the name of the toxins and where the spider can be. But it is true that it can be, like some spiders can be dispersed by human cause. So yes, there is no like completely security that you are not going to find it. But generally they are like in the region. Great. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. <laughs> we can be one of those vessels that, that transport spiders as well. Um, another question that came up was when we were talking, when you were talking about the silk. So the question is, is the spider silk used in products made by spiders or are they art artificially created by humans? Yes. So that actually is one of the barriers that human like a, one of the barriers for the large production of a spider silk. Like you cannot keep spiders, like many spiders in the same place because they are going to kill each other. They are predators. Uh, so the, you cannot keep at them, like for example, worms to produce silk. Um, so recently, or like some couple years or more years um, through the date, uh, it has been through bacteria, it has been through yeast, it has been through even, I think that it was a uh, goat milk, like uh, it has been GMO actually. Like you insert the, the um, information about that gene that produced the silk and 
and then it can produce by other organisms. Mm, that's awesome. <laughs> Um, another question was, can you explain what book lungs are? Yeah, yeah. So book lungs are like some type of structures. I'm, I'm just going to the, probably the presentation to show that. They are made like a, of some lamella. Lamella are like some plates, some kind of plates where there is the interchange of the gases. So. In the ventral part of the spider, in the abdomen, they have this type of structures. In some spiders can be just one pair or in some other can be two pairs of those book lungs. So what they have is like type of lamella that permit the interchange. So we have emolymph that is going to flow through that lamella. And when the air, the air enter like through this opening, it can be that interchange. I, I wish I can show with my hands, <laughs> but it, it can be the interchange. Like we can see here um, the directions, like of the emolymph and the, and the air entering and through that lamella is occur the interchange. Mm. Yeah, seeing that image is really helpful and understanding some of that. Thanks for finding that for us. <laughs> Um, another question, kind of funny, but it is a real question. How should one handle a spider wandering in their kitchen other than burning the whole house down? So, you know, if we find a spider in our home, what should we do? <laughs> yeah, it, it depends on the spider, of course. Uh, but generally, what I do is like with a, a cup and a paper, I just try to put it like this. I, I don't know if everybody can see. <laughs> like just put the paper under and the cup up and just try to get it outside. Yeah, it's an, an human, a human way to treat those animals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I have spiders. I, I have spiders as roommates and you know, I let them be. <laughs> yeah, they are, they are good too. Like yeah. Sometimes Sometimes we have leftovers or I don't know, and that attract other kind of bugs. Yeah. So spiders, what do is, is that like they keep it in control. They can help us in our houses too. Great, thanks. Uh, we have a couple more minutes for more questions. Um, let's see, are daddy long legs related to scorpions? So it depends on the daddy long legs that we are talking. So if it is the daddy long legs that are spiders, uh, they are related to scorpions because they are inside the arachnid group. So the arachnid groups is like um, jerarchically bigger than the spiders. And in the arachnid group, like there are many, many subgroups. One of them is the scorpions. So yes, it is related because all of them are related in that group, but it is not closely related. If you mm -hmm. are asking about the other daddy long legs that are the opilions, opilions are other group inside the arachnids. It is the same thing. They are related because all of them are arachnids, but that doesn't mean that they are in the same group. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. Another question I see in the chat is, do spiders have a microbiome? Um, micro microbiome? Microbiome, yes. Sorry. Yeah, I suppose. I suppose. I, I really don't know about, like, uh, in detail about the digestion of the spiders. I know that there is a digestion that is internally and that there is externally. So that means that when they release the venom, they release also enzymes that are digestive, that they digest the animal from outside. So what they consume is liquid. Actually, they don't consume like hard preys. And internally, there is other kind of um, digestive. So I guess that as us, there must be like I don't know I, I really don't know if there are like some studies about like the microbiome or 
like how microbes are like related to their to its system mm -hmm. but yes that is an interesting question thank you Let's see we have a couple more minutes uh another question i see here is someone has had two chilean tarantulas for over 20 years do you know how long they do they live <laughs> so yes um it depends it depends on on the species it depends if it is a female or a male so as i was telling you um the males like they just start like to get in a reproductive act active after four or seven years and then they live maybe four months five months just for reproduction but the females can live between 10, 20 years, even 30 years. Like in the conditions, like for example, if we have it in our home that where it has food all the time, it doesn't have predators, uh, the animal is going to have a long life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then and I think this is the only other question I see in the chat and it's, in regards to, I think it's the last slide from your presentation. Um, the question is, what are the spiders that are at the far right of the second row? So I think it's like, yeah, the final considerations. Yeah, so the far right second row. Far right second row, this one? Yeah. Yeah, so that one is, a, is an Araneide, that is an old web spider. And it is called um, Gaceracanta cangriformis. And cangriformis because it looks like kind of a crab. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the, the comment was um, from Terrence. We have a lot of them in our swamps in Louisiana. I think we call them crab spiders, but they look different than the yellow spider you showed. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Uh, they they are very interesting, no? Like all those forms are just unbelievable. Yeah, so I think those were uh, most of all of all the questions I saw in the in the chat. So thank you all for for submitting all your questions and and thank you, Jamie, for addressing all of those. It was super informative, and I'm sure we all learned so much. <laughs> thank you so much. Aurora, do you want to go to the Mentimeter and see about the sharing? Or So what are your feelings about spiders? We're seeing some of the things that you all mentioned in here. I'm seeing that they helped us protect from scarier insects. <laughs> yes. Uh, I think spiders get a bad reputation because of the fear people have about them. If only people would get over that fear and discover how cool and charming they can be. Yes. So many superpowers. I know, right? <laughs> uh, that's so cool. Um, yeah, I wouldn't want one on my face, but I wouldn't mind having a couple of eight-legged roommates around. That, yeah, that's true. Yeah, so many responses. Thank you all so much for contributing to that. And you're getting a lot of praise in the chat as well, Jamie. Everyone thanking you for such a wonderful presentation. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us and for being such a wonderful audience. Yeah. Thank you all so much and and happy almost Halloween. Happy Dia de los Muertos. Happy spooky season. Um, thank you all.